Welcome back to Bargaining in War. This is a technical lecture on why there is a unique equilibrium to the ultimatum game. To recap from last time, the ultimatum game featured A making a demand X between 0 and 1, and B accepting or rejecting. What we discovered working backward was that B had to accept any X less than P plus CB, it had to reject any demand X greater than P plus CB, and in the middle case where X was exactly equal to P plus CB, B was indifferent between accepting and rejecting. What we assumed before was that B would accept with probability 1. And conditional on that, we found an equilibrium where A demands that quantity, P plus CB, and B accepts. The task for here now is to show that if we relax that assumption, and we assume that B, instead of accepting with certainty, accepts with probability, say, mm, sigma A, which is some value between 0 and 1. So it could be 0, and it can go all the way up into 1, but not actually reach 1, because if it were 1, then we would be in the previous case. If we can show that there are no other equilibria under this assumption, then we've done our job, and we've shown that the equilibrium that we uncovered last time is the unique equilibrium to the ultimatum game. How do we go about doing that? Well, we still know from before exactly what happens in the previous cases, where B is accepting with certainty or B is rejecting with certainty in this case here and this case here. What we need to explore then is what happens in this middle case now that B is going to be rejecting with positive probability. So let's go ahead and write out that utility for A. After all, we care about what A's payoff is because A is trying to optimize its demand. Well, it's going to be an expectation now that B is randomizing. If A were to demand P plus CB, then with probability sigma, B would accept, and A's payoff would just be that demand size, which is P plus CB. With the remaining probability, 1 minus sigma, we would have B reject, and A would earn its war payoff, which is P minus CA. So this first question that we're going to ask is, can A do better than make that sort of demand? Why? Well, we've already shown that every other demand can't really be optimal. If A were to demand something less than P plus CB, it would want to have something slightly larger and slightly larger and slightly larger, because as long as that value is strictly below P plus CB, B has to accept, and A always gets slightly more by demanding a little bit more. Moreover, we saw that intentionally inducing a rejection is always going to be bad. That will give you a payoff of P minus CA, your war payoff, and you can always do a little bit better by, say, making a demand like P, which guarantees acceptance and guarantees that you get some sort of share of the surplus rather than paying a cost for war and not extracting any surplus. So if we can show that A can profitably deviate away from making the demand P plus CB, which earns it this quantity here, then we'll have shown that there's no demand that is optimal for A. And if there is no demand that is optimal for A, then we don't have an equilibrium under the assumption that B is rejecting with positive probability. We only have an equilibrium where B accepts with certainty when indifferent. Okay, so how do we find out whether there is some alternative demand out there that is going to pay more for A than what we have written down there? Well, Think about the demand P plus CB minus epsilon, where as always, we think of epsilon as some very small positive number. Going from up here, because we're subtracting out epsilon, we know that B is going to accept such a demand. And so A's payoff is simply that demand size, P plus CB minus epsilon. So if we can show that that utility of P plus CB minus epsilon is better than what it would be getting if it were to make that demand that makes B indifferent, then we'll have done our job. We'll have shown that A has a profitable deviation. To do that, it might help if we distribute everything out on the left-hand side. So let's go ahead and do that. Sigma A times P plus sigma CB. Foil that. We have P minus CA. We have sigma p, and then we have plus sigma ca. 
less than P plus CB minus epsilon. Okay, we'll notice that we have a sigma A and a negative sigma A times P, both cases, so those cancel out. We also have a P on both sides, those cancel out. And what we're left with is some epsilon having to be less than, let's see, if we move CA over to the other side, we have CA plus CB. We also have now subtracting out onto the other side, a sigma alpha CA and a C, C, sigma alpha uh, CB, which can then be reduced to, or combining terms, CA plus CB times one minus A. If you look at that, you'll see that the right-hand side is a positive amount. Why is that? Well, CA and CB are both positive amounts, and one minus sigma A, remember that sigma A goes up into one, but not actually reaching one, right here. So that means that it's a number less than one. So when you take one minus that number, that's some positive value. And so we have a positive value over here, which means we can always find an epsilon value that is going to satisfy this. So that was a bit technical, but if we draw a picture of what's going on, it'll be very clear what's happening in this proof. So let's refamiliarize ourselves with the payoff graph from last time where we have x on the x-axis and a's utility as a function of x on the y-axis. What we saw is that there's this critical cut point P plus CB where everything to the left of P plus CB has B accepting. And so a's demand just increases linearly. Under the assumption that B accepts with certainty when indifferent, we know that at that cut point of P plus CB, B's utility is actually right there. Here, that's not actually the case. Here, if we draw out where the P minus CA value is, that's A's payoff for war. If we look at the payoff from right here, A's utility is something between P plus CB and P minus CA we're weighing it by this factor of sigma a and one minus sigma a. So what that means is that a's utility falls somewhere in between. We don't exactly know where because we're doing this generally. It could in fact go all the way down here. So we're actually having a filled in circle down there. But just to illustrate, we're gonna have it somewhere in the middle. The important thing is that it's not right here. So that's what A's utility function looks like. Think about A trying to maximize this utility function. Well, it's gonna to wanna to try to demand something going up and up and up this slope, because as you go up that slope, you're getting higher and higher and higher and closer to the peak. The problem is you can never actually reach the pinnacle of this part of the utility function, because as you keep getting closer and closer and closer to that maximum, you can always get a small enough epsilon, namely of this size here, where that is going to be simultaneously better than what you had before. And also if you choose an epsilon that is small enough, it's not going to be exceeding this quantity that sends you from up at the top of the pinnacle all the way down to this value of P minus CA. So what that means is that there is no X value that optimizes A's utility function. This is a key point because if you read papers on the ultimatum game, you will often see authors not exactly informing the reader why this is happening, either assuming that the reader knows it or because the author may be misinformed him or herself about the subject matter. They may think that there are other equilibria out there to the ultimatum game and that we're just assuming that the receiver of the demand accepts when indifferent. That's not actually the case. In fact, there is only a single equilibrium, and in that equilibrium, the receiver, in this case state B, is accepting when indifferent. So for the sake of our sanity, throughout the rest of this course, whenever we're looking at one of these ultimatum games, we are going to assume that the receiver accepts when indifferent and not go deep into doing this proof over and over and over again. Because whenever we have an ultimatum game that looks like this, 
with some rare exceptions, which you will encounter at some point if you go deep enough into the textbook, you're going to have a unique solution. And there's not going to be anything else out there where B is accepting and rejecting with positive probability and that resulting in a different equilibrium. So again, whenever you're looking at one of these games, unless I have in the lecture or in the textbook a suggestion that we might need to think about this otherwise, you may just assume that we're going to have the receiver accept when indifferent. Okay, that's why there is a unique solution to the ultimatum game. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.